welcome to Calming the ADHD Family, a summit on brain hacks for a calm, confident, connected family. My name is Laura Dawn, and I am your host. I am an ADHD warrior mama to two beautiful neurodiverse boys and the founder of the ADHD Village. Understanding what ADHD really is, is the first step in supporting your child with ADHD. And that is what we are going to learn from this interview. I am so excited, so excited to introduce you to Dr. Ned Hallowell. Dr. Hallowell is the leading ADHD expert, a New York Times bestselling author on many ADHD books, including my favorite, ADHD 2.0. And Dr. Hallowell really gets it because he has ADHD too. Dr. Hallowell, welcome. This is such an honor and a privilege to speak with you. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to speak with you as well. You're, you're doing wonderful work. I'm very impressed. Oh, thank you so much. That's so kind of you. Um, I always recommend your book, ADHD 2.0 to families. It's like the ADHD user's manual. Um, and <laughs> I have really loved this book. It's all written all through it and dog tagged and <laughs> as you can see. Oh, that's great. I love to see that. I love to see that. Oh, that's um, wonderful. In the introduction of the book, you address how our thoughts about ADHD can make us feel, which ultimately drives our actions. So if we're feeling like overwhelmed by the pain and the suffering of ADHD, then we're going to feel bad about having ADHD or about our kids having ADHD, which then leads to actions that can be very frightening, really addiction, violence, suicide. But if we understand ADHD, and we have strategies and supports for those struggles, ADHD can be a superpower. Can you explain how our thoughts and understanding of our child's ADHD shapes our feelings and our actions? Yeah, it, it's really important that you frame it uh, properly for a child, but for an adult as well. The term ADHD, it's, it's a completely inaccurate term. It's not a deficit disorder. I have the condition myself. I also have dyslexia. I, I don't have a deficit of attention. I have an abundance of attention. My challenge is to control it. And that's that's true for the kids, for the for the adults. We our mind is a is a we we have a Ferrari engine for a brain. We have this incredible race car for a brain. It's constantly going and coming up with new ideas and churning and generating and creating and imagining and it's just going going a mile a minute uh, it's it's the 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 challenge is to to somehow control it so it's like a ferrari engine with bicycle brakes so i'm a brake specialist so if you come to see me i will help you and i tell kids this i say forget about the term adhd it's the term you'll hear but it is in no way descriptive or accurate uh, instead think of a ferrari engine for a brain with bicycle brakes and, and we'll work on strengthening your brakes together. And then when you do have good brakes, you'll become a champion. Until then, you could spin out on curves. So, you know, it's a Ferrari with no brakes is pretty dangerous. And ADD undealt with is pretty dangerous too. But a Ferrari with good brakes, that's a car that wins races. So you're on your way, I'll tell the kid, to winning races. Uh, applies to girls and boys and um, uh uh, you know, it's an analogy that, that really does capture what this condition is all about. Lots of power. We have incredible imagination. We're the dreamer, the visioner, the entrepreneur, the seer. Um, we're, we're the inventor, the discoverer. The, we're the, uh, the people who think outside the box. We're the people who, you know, make things happen. Who, whoever invented the wheel certainly had this condition. <laughs> uh, you know, so so... But if you don't learn to take care of it, if you don't learn to strengthen your brakes, it can be a disaster. I mean, that's the prison population. That's the addicted population. That's the unemployed population, the multiply divorced, the marginalized, the, the down and out. So it, it's high stakes poker. If you can learn how to strengthen your brakes, if you can learn how to develop some sense of control, the sky's the limit. But if you don't, well, it can be pretty terrible. 
I'm so glad you brought up the analogy of the Ferrari car because that's how I explained to my oldest son when he was about five years old that he had ADHD. I said, it's like your brain is like a Ferrari. And he was so excited that he was a race car and his friends were sedans and vans. He just loved that idea. And he was so, and he still is so energetic. So that, that race car thing was something that really stuck to him. And, and teaching kids that it's about strengthening their brakes it's such a positive spin for them rather than, you know, focusing on the struggles and the negatives. And, and it's not spin doctoring. It's the truth. I mean, we, we really do have extraordinary imagination and, and uh, Russ Barkley, who is one of the great researchers in the field conceptualizes ADD as a, as a state of relative disinhibition. You can't inhibit what's coming in. Hence you're distractible. You can't inhibit what's going out, hence you're impulsive and, and hyperactive, the three core symptoms of ADD. Well, that's a fancy way of saying race car brain with bicycle brakes. Your brain is going real fast, but you can't control it. And hence you can be distractible, impulsive, and restless. But even there, take those three core symptoms when in the DSM defines the condition in terms of those three core symptoms. Even there, if you take each one of those and turn it on its head, you get a positive. The flip side of, of distractibility is curiosity. And we're endlessly curious. We are driven by curiosity. We want to know what's that, what's that, what's that. And sometimes we'll stick our nose where we shouldn't. You know, sometimes, you know, we'll we'll look into things where we're, we're not supposed to be there. But other times we'll look at that Petri dish and say, hey, that doesn't look the same. And we discover penicillin. So it is it is curiosity that drives us. And curiosity you can't buy and you can't teach you can encourage it and unfortunately a lot of adults discourage it in these kids but um, it, it is a, an, an, an innate uh, drive that we have we we are driven by curiosity when i was a kid they used to call me the question box and the adults would get tired of me asking endless questions but i was endlessly curious and i still am then impulsivity the, the second so-called negative symptom. Think about it for a minute. What is creativity but impulsivity gone right? You don't plan to have a creative idea. You don't say it's 10 o'clock time for my new earth-shaking idea. <laughs> no, no they, they come unbidden, unexpectedly. They pop. They depend upon some degree of disinhibition. They depend upon the ability to be spontaneous, to let completely irrelevant, extraneous ideas into the mind, and 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 hence they come impulsively, uh, unbidden, unplanned. But if you're not receptive to them, then you can miss penicillin, or you can miss the wheel, or you can miss whatever your new idea might happen to be. And then the third symptom, hyperactivity, you get to be my age, I'm 72 years old, it's called energy. I'm really glad to have this little turbo pack on my back. You know, I mean, it, it's uh, you know, I, I've I've got a ton of energy, and I, and I'm still I'm working on my 22nd book. You know, I, my my wife and I have raised uh, three children together. I've got uh, I've got offices in, on the East Coast and the West Coast, and you know, and I'm and I'm uh, you know a busy little beaver, but. Uh, um, uh, you know, and, and I love being alive, you know, I, 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 I know it won't go on forever, but I, I sure do love my chance to exercise my creativity and my curiosity and, and try to find ways of, of doing it to, that are useful to other people. So the world's a banquet, but for, for a lot of kids and adults, if they're not introduced to it properly, the world is anything but a banquet. It's it's a dismal, depressing, frustrating, forbidding place. And and uh, I mean, these are the kids throughout history. These are the battered children, you know. It, it and it's still standard practice in some parts of the country, of the United States, you know, to hit kids, to spank them, and and uh, or worse, whip them, you know. And and uh, and you'll hear parents say, "All he needs is a good kick in the ass," and and. That's not what he needs, you know, and, and um, but that's what how these kids have been dealt with for thousands of years. They, they are the kids who are horribly mistreated. And um, in fact, a friend of mine, the man who wrote who, who wrote the Captain Underpants series, Dave oh, Pilkey. Yeah. 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 And then his, his books have sold, I think, 100 million copies now. He's an incredible. He's like the Pied Piper. 
But he was, when he was in school, he went to a, a Lutheran school in the Midwest of the United States. Uh, because he had the talent of making other kids laugh, he was paddled regularly. The principal would take him and make him bend over and he'd whack him with a board often. I mean, it happened, it happened up through high school. They were doing this to high school students. And, and uh, he, he, he rarely a week would go by that he, that he didn't have to get paddled with this board. One time the principal broke it over his butt and uh, he became a hero around the school because he broke the paddle, you know. And, and, but that kind of abuse did not turn him into an angry, bitter man. You'd think it might have. No, instead he turns it and he's the Pied Piper. He's writing these wonderful, wonderful children's stories that kids learn how to read often by reading uh, Captain Underpants. And, you know, and, and Dave has the same kind of brain I have. He has ADD and dyslexia. And here he is writing these, uh, these, these wonderful fables and stories. It, it's, and that's another quality that we tend to have. We tend to be very resilient. You can beat us, you can scorn us, you can ridicule us. We tend to bounce back, but you shouldn't have to go through that. You know, you, you shouldn't have to endure uh, shame, punishment, pain, you know, simply for being who you are, um, simply for having a sense of humor and being able to come up with new ideas and and um, and so that that's what we we need to do. We need to help teachers and parents understand these children instead of trying to change them into being someone they're not. That's so important. ADHD is really often misunderstood by by the general public, but even by parents and teachers. Um, and this misunderstanding can have serious impacts on a, a child living with ADHD. Like they are not lazy. They are not stupid or slow or bad. ADHD is not a result of poor parenting. I can't tell you how many times people have said to me about my own kids, oh, he just needs, you know, military school, or he just needs, right. give them to me for a weekend and, <laughs> right, and I'll change right. things. And right, right, right. ADHD and that usually means difference. some form of physical punishment. It, yeah. it, it's uh, unfortunate, but people still resort to that. And it's, it's, I mean, a ton of research has shown it's very counterproductive. Now you mentioned the, I, I love how you the how you've used curiosity, creativity, and energy so the positive side of the main traits of ADHD. I'm just right. wondering if a child is on medication for ADHD, how does that impact their curiosity? and their creativity. Oh, it just makes it sharper. What, what meds do is very similar to what eyeglasses do. They don't make you smarter, but they allow you to use your smarts more effectively. Uh, and, and, and that's what the meds do when they work. Uh, they, they don't in any way take anything away from these kids. And if they did, you just stop it. You know, the, the medication, whatever it does is immediately reversible by stopping it. So if you turn purple, just don't take it again. You'll go back to your original color. You know, but uh, um, they're, the meds, the, the best analogy is eyeglasses. They, they, they work like eyeglasses and, and they allow you to use your talents more effectively. Absolutely. Um, when, you know, when we ask parents or teachers what their understanding of ADHD is, often they're able to list like a bunch of traits of what the child has. They're forgetful, they're disorganized, they're distracted, they're impulsive, hyperactive, they're always getting into trouble. Um, but what's really going on inside their brain is not really understood. Can you help us? I know your book does a fabulous job of really going into detail of what's going inside the brain, but can you give us the Cole's Notes version? What's happening? Yeah, I mean, in it, it, it's all imagination. You know, the, the the brains of us who have this condition, we're constantly in motion. We're new ideas, new thoughts, new impulses, new images, new plans, new ventures, new businesses we want to start, or play dates we want to set up, or uh, vehicles we want to try riding, or places we want to go on holiday, or you know, we're we're just we're constantly coming up with new stuff. And again, the challenge is to organize it and use it in some way. And, and then to do the things we don't necessarily want to do, homework, uh, make your bed, clean up your room, 
uh, all of those, you got to find a way to get those done. So, you know, so there, there's work to be done to sort of strengthen these brakes or a, another analogy I use is to, you know, tame this bucking bronco, you know, so you can actually ride the horse and not have the horse throw you off. And, the, you know, the, the, this brain can throw kids off and throw adults off, too. I mean, a lot of adults who haven't learned how to ride their brain, you know, they get thrown every day. And so they underachieve, they get fired, they they're you know their marriage fails or they they get hooked on drugs or they they go broke because they're going for another harebrained scheme you know so so it's important that you know you don't want to give up your unique qualities but at the same time you want to learn how to to tame them enough to uh, i don't like the word break the bucking bronco but but you want to be able to saddle it and ride it and and but while retaining its energy, retaining its spirit, retaining its uh, wonderful capacity to you know take you to new places. And how do we help our kids to do that? Well, you know, it begins with a diagnosis and framing it in such a way that they want to work on it. If you tell him he's got a deficit disorder and he should see a tutor, he's going to be completely resistant to the whole thing. But if you say you've got a race car brain with bicycle brakes and I'm a brake specialist and you're a champion in the making, then he or she will get interested. And then, and then how you do it, it there, fortunately, there are many tools in our toolbox. Um, the most famous one is medication, and it, it, it's rightly famous. When it works, it's a godsend. It is in no way necessary, but I think everyone ought to give it a try because there's no downside. And the upside is huge. If the meds work, they make all the other interventions that much more effective. Now, the other interventions, coaching, learning new strategies, techniques, routines. Um, coaching is, you know, it's, it's basically what a mom does minus the nag factor. You know, <laughs> so it's either done by mom or someone you hire as a coach. A physical exercise, tremendously helpful. There's a new kind of exercise, the Zing program that I talk about in chapter three mm -hmm. of ADHD 2.0 that takes advantage of new research regarding the cerebellum. And it shows how balancing exercises can have a really formative effect uh, and, and basically treat, uh, I tell the story of a little boy in China, I treated all the way in Shanghai, uh, basically by emailing his mother and coaching them on how to do these balancing exercises. And he went from in September, the bottom of the class, a behavior problem to, by Christmas, top of the class, model student, wonderful behavior. And he, he won the prize for being the top student in the, in the fourth grade class. And um, um, it, it's a touching little story. The prize was a chocolate. I guess they don't give huge prizes in, in his school, but he brought home this chocolate and he showed it to his mom and he said, mom, I, I won this for being best student. And, and mom said, oh, that's wonderful. Let's eat it. It was a big chocolate. And uh, he said, oh, no, mom. And he placed it on the mantelpiece. He said, this is far too precious ever to eat. <laughs> and, oh. and you can see the, the incredible elevation of his self-esteem, motivation, hope for the future. I mean, I'm still in touch with this little boy. He's still doing the exercises. I told him, you don't need to do them anymore. You know, you, these are, this is a couple of years ago. Your brain has changed. You, you, you've gotten the benefit. He said, oh, Dr. Hallowell, I'm going to do these forever. I mean, he, it, it really brought him out of um, a dungeon where he was feeling he was being punished regularly, shamed regularly, you know, disgracing his family, and particularly in China. That's, that's a big deal. And now the, all the other parents in the school are asking mom, what's your secret? What did you do? Did you, did you have some magic potion? We did all this with no medication whatsoever. And uh, you know, so medication is not necessary. At the same time, don't be afraid of trying it because when it works, it's the easiest intervention we've got. And in the short term, it's the most powerful. In the long term, what I call connection is the most powerful. You know, Feeling that you're a part of something uh, essentially love, but you, you know, it doesn't have to be love, but, but the feeling you're a part of something that you're a member of something that, you know, I, I wrote a short essay recently about the, the, what you need to do when you're growing up, what, what do you, what do you need to do during childhood? What do you, what's the most important thing you can do between the ages of zero and 25? 
and people say, well, get into the best school or, you know, lay your foundation for a great career or, you know, whatever. And I said, no, the most important thing you can do while you're growing up is to fall in love. Now, sure, you may fall in love with a person, but more important, fall in love with, a, with, a, with, a, with an idea or with an activity or with a musical instrument or with, with a, you know, a, a subject or with a blade of grass. I, 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 the other day I was talking about E.O. Wilson, the great entomologist and insect specialist at Harvard, probably the, the greatest to ever live. He recently died. Well, he was a lonely little boy in Alabama, Alabama. And I think he probably had ADHD, but we can't say for sure, but he was a lonely little boy. And uh, his, but his brain was going constantly. So what did he do? He went to the empty vacant lot next to where he lived in, in Alabama. And he got down on the ground and he started studying ants. So he fell in love with ants. And he, he once signed a book for me and he draws a little ant to, instead of his signature. He fell in love with ants as a little boy and as a form of, of connection. And he carried it on to being a, one of the greatest entomologists in the world, and, and you know, and so maybe the maybe you fall in love with flying, or maybe you fall in love with sewing, or maybe you fall in love with a a, a band or a instrument. You fall in love with singing. Maybe you fall in love with cooking. Maybe you fall fall in love with a with a, a book or a period of history. You know, just think of all the. That's why it's so important to encourage interests and enthusiasms in kids, because once you fall in love. It lasts for the rest of your life. I fell in love with writing uh, when I was in the 12th grade. I went to a school called Exeter in the United States and I had this wonderful 12th grade teacher. His picture is up above me right oh. here. And he, he, he encouraged me to write a novel. And I write a novel? I thought I knew Exeter was a tough school. I didn't know I had to write a novel. But I took the challenge and I proceeded to go ahead and write a novel, won the English prize. And, and it but what it got, what, what it did was it gave me a sense of the incredible passion of tackling something very difficult and, and doing it well. Was it a great novel? No. Was it published? No. But it was good enough to, to win the prize at a, at a top-notch school. And more than that, it was good enough that I could prove to myself that I could do something that had looked to be impossible. And once you do that, you fall in love with doing that again and again and again. Look at you. You're, you're tackling this completely new uh, project, <laughs> you're, this completely new uh, thing that you're doing, and you, you're doing it, you know, you're not still in your 20s. You're, you know, you're, you're doing it, and, and, and you're, you're just putting yourself heart and soul into it, and it's a wonderful thing to see. You've fallen in love, you know, and, 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 and that's what I mean by falling in love. We, and we ADDers are particularly good at that. What we what we have to watch out for is falling in love with too many things. You know, we 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 become victim of our own enthusiasms. We want to do everything, and then you, that's where you need a coach or somebody to say, "Wait a minute, you know, down boy, down girl. There's only so <laughs> much you can do in a day," and and uh, and and you know. So, uh, but that concept of what you need to do is fall in love. If only more teachers and parents understood that because that's what sustains you over a lifetime i mean my love of, of writing you know and writing it, loving writing is like loving golf you know it sucks you know you're never <laughs> as good as you want to be you know so it, it, it it's a it's a it's a difficult love affair uh, loving writing but m loving anything that's challenging is is difficult and you see and that's another important point you 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 learn not to take victory and defeat uh, seriously, you know, there's a great line from Kipling's poem, If, that says, if you can look at triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, victory is not as wonderful as it's cracked up to be, nor as defeat as devastating as it's cracked up to be. What matters is the love of the game. The victories and the defeats will come. They, nobody wins every time. Nobody loses every time. The victories and defeats will come, and you want to you want to take them in stride. And what allows you to do that, your 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 shock absorbers, if you will, is your love of the game. And if you have a game you love to play, if you have several you love to play, like I love what I'm doing right now with you. 
I also love uh, seeing patients. I also love writing, you know. I also happen to love raising my children, you know. So, you know, you, 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 if you have a series of loves and you tend your loves, then the, the wins and the losses are not the scoreboard. The, the scoreboard is, is your heart full? Are you, are you just that? Is your heart full? Are you, are you feeling fulfilled because you're investing? I, like you do, you teach kindergarten. I'm just sure you just love those kids and you invest your, your, your you know, and, and, and I can just tell looking at you, you're a wonderful kindergarten teacher, but you're also a wonderful, you know, doer of what you're doing now, you know, and, and that's the message you want to give people, you know, life, we only get one shot and it, it's this great opportunity. So don't shut down what ought to be so positive by saying, well, I'm a loser or I didn't win or I don't stand a chance or I'm not rich enough or thin enough or smart enough or well-connected enough, you know, get out of the, that, you know, what my old friend, John Crawl used to say, be a, a dream maker, not a dream breaker. And so what you want to do for these kids is be a dream maker. Sure, tell them this is what they got to do to do it. You know, writing a novel, for example, is not easy. Uh, any, any more than for a kindergartner, building a castle of blocks is easy, you know, but uh, and the castle will fall over. But that's OK. You build it again, you know, and, and that's what you do. Nobody rides a bike the first time they get on it. Uh, so you, you want to just encourage the expression of enthusiasm. And, and that, that, that's what leads to a wonderful life. I love that. I love that. And that's, that's what builds our kids' confidence. And, um, you know, I think about kids with ADHD and they have, they have a lot of negative self-talk and they, yeah. they take things really hard. But if we can really foster the things and celebrate the things that they love and that they're passionate about and have that be the focus. Exactly, exactly, exactly. exactly. Your, book, your book offers lifestyle hacks for thriving with ADHD. And the one that really resonated with me the most was tapping into the healing power of connection like you were just yeah. speaking about. Yeah. Um, do you have any suggestions for parents how they can help build their connections with their kids? Oh, love them, have fun with them. I mean, it, it, do what comes naturally. My first rule of parenting is enjoy your children. If you're enjoying them, it's almost for sure you're doing it right unless you're just smoking dope with them all day. You know, <laughs> if, if, you're in, if you're enjoying them, it's almost for sure you're doing it right. And uh, it's the greatest thing in the world. The greatest thing I ever did with my wife was have these three kids. You know, it, it's, a, it's an incredible experience. Now, not saying everybody should have kids, but if you do have kids, uh, good for you. And just don't waste it by not spending time with them, you know, because the, the, all they need is your time. All they need is your time and attention. And don't worry if you get angry. Kids with ADD are very provocative. You know, you, you lose it sometimes. Uh, don't hit them. That, that's a bad idea. But you, it's fine if you get angry. You know, you can't raise kids without getting angry. Um, and um, just have fun with them. Enjoy them. You know, they're, believe me, they're the best thing you'll ever do. I love that. And I think that's a great, um, I usually ask the speakers at the end of the interview, what's one actionable step that you could offer parents? But I think what you've just said there is perfect. Enjoy them, good. play with them, have fun with them. Good, As, good. Do you have any other last words? Of no, wisdom? that's a that's a great one. And and just uh, thank you all for, for listening. Thank you for inviting me on. And thank you for what you're doing. It's wonderful work. You know, I, I love to see you breaking new ground in your own life and, and, and by example, encouraging others to do the same. Thank you so much. And it has been honestly like so exciting and such an absolute honor to speak with you and to learn from you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Hallowell. Well, well thank you. And the feeling is mutual. I admire what you're doing tremendously. Thank you. And parents, I invite you to keep this conversation going on Facebook in my group, The ADHD Village. Under Dr. Hallowell's thread, comment what you learned today and how you will use this knowledge to bring some calm and connection into your family. What will your next step be? And everyone who comments on this thread will be entered in a draw to win the VIP All Access Pass, which includes um, all the interviews for a year, the action workbook, 
and the 21 day fattest challenge for kids. Parents, thank you for watching. I hope that you will join us for the next interview. And it really does take a village to raise a child, especially if that child has ADHD. I am honored to be a part of your village. Thank you for spending this time with Dr. Hallowell and myself. It takes a loving parent to make this commitment to take the steps in creating your calm, confident, connected family. Sending you all lots of love and hoping that your child falls in love soon. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hallowell. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Take care.